ions is actually, in my opinion, students pick it up a lot quicker. That we spend a lot more time on isotopes for some reason because that's always an issue. But ions are a little bit easier. Um, they're on the outside, and you can remove them very easily. Um, so if you take a look at this sodium atom that you see in front of you, if we actually, am, like we said earlier, a neutral sodium atom is, uh, has atomic number 11. Therefore, how many electrons does he have? He has 11. You can count them up there. Two in the first level, eight in the next level, and one in the very outside. However, it does not like having a neutral number. It wants to try to have that, but there's also something because of those levels that uh, Niels Bohr discovered that they want to try to balance out. And that's where we get into the octet rule and things like that. It rather have a full shell than have just one in the outer shell and it not be balanced out. So what it's going to do is want to lose that outer electron to drop down on the level. That gives us our ions, and this is why we end up having bonds, because then they're more attracted to other things. So if you remember how a magnet works, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, uh, magnets, the opposites attract. And so that's what, uh, how all this really works, is just because of how uh, the attraction is. So let's get right to the definitions. Uh, an ion is basically an atom that has gained or lost electrons. So what charge is electrons? Negative. So if you lose negativity, are you going to become more negative or more positive? positive? More positive. And if you gain more negativity, you're going to be negative. more negative. So that gets us the only two types you can have. Okay, we've been talking about if they're neutral, that's great. Um, but you get two types. You get the cation and uh, the anion. So cations are positive, anions are negative. Cation is a positive ion that has lost electrons. It can lose many and become positive. An anion is one that is negative and it has gained more. How people have remembered this by looking at the names, cation has a T, which looks like a plus sign. So that's why they kind of go with the positive ion kind of thing. And that is how you can remember for it being a plus sign. Other people look at anion, they see it in, and they think negative are basically negative ions, that means they have gained electrons. And I will give you a hint, depending on the side of the periodic table you're on, you're either going to gain more or lose electrons. And that is a great way of looking at it. I'm going to show you some little tricks here to kind of get that. Do keep this in mind, atoms never gain or lose protons or neutrons, except in nuclear reactions. We're not talking about nuclear reactions anymore though. We're all done with that. So another way to memorize all this is how my uh, other chemistry teacher remembered it is uh, she said cation, has the word cat in it. Well, she, she was a cat lady, so she's like, well, cats are positive, positive creatures. And I, uh, immediately when I say that, other people start shaking their head, no. <laughs> I had a little booger that uh, scratched me. So no, they're not positive. Uh, and then they hear the word anion, and it sounds like ants, uh, and they think that they're negative. And so that's kind of how they remembered it also. So there's many ways that you can remember the difference. Me, I just read the word and actually just know the meaning. So now we get into the fun part. This gets into a formula, and their formula's not on the slides, but I'll give it to you. Basically, the protons plus the electrons will give you the charge. And it's very simple. You don't even have to have the formula. Most people like it. So let me put it this way. If you have the same number of protons, let's take lithium again, as atomic number three. So that means it has three protons, right? C. Therefore, in a neutral atom, it has three electrons. Okay? But, however, what is the charge of electrons? Negative. So, when you add these two together, what do you get? Well, you know, negative with the positive, that's really, really this whole thing is three minus three, which is zero. That's why it's a neutral atom. But let's say for... Uh, Change the electrons. And so let's see, it's lithium. Let's say it has two electrons. Okay, what's its overall charge going to be? Okay, so three minus two, which is going to be positive one. So you can see how the charge can change with depending on how many protons and electrons it has. So it really all depends on how those electrons vary. Now note the protons do not vary. So you can actually use this over and over if you're really having that much trouble. People still have issue with it. 
So if we take a look at magnesium here, magnesium is an atom that has how many protons? So it has 12 protons, okay? And therefore, if it, it says magnesium, and notice they don't give you a symbol here, that means it's neutral. So if it's neutral, it also has the same number of electrons. Well, 12 minus 12 is zero. Okay. All right, well, this one though has a plus two charge. Okay, so we'll put this on the formula real quick. Same thing as magnesium. So we know it has 12 protons. We do not know how many electrons it has, but we do have its overall charge, which is plus two. So then I ask you the question, let's just rearrange this for simple purposes. What minus what will give you plus two? 10. That is right. 12 minus 10, you're left over with a positive two. So you have 12 protons, 10 electrons, giving you a positive two charge. See how that kind of helps? Chlorine, find chlorine on the periodic table. 17. 17? All right, so it has 17 protons. Does it have a charge up here? No. Nope, so it's gonna have the same number. 17 minus 17, zero. But if you look up here, this chlorine has a negative charge. It does not give you the, oh, by the way, in chemistry, we don't use the number one. We just don't, we just leave the sign there and assume you know. So this chlorine has a negative one charge. So if you see just negative, that's negative one. Okay, if it was anything greater than a number, they'd write it down, so in case you didn't know that. So uh, it's still 17 protons, but it has a negative one charge. So 17, basically minus what, will give you negative one? 18 electrons. 18. And that will work every time. So anytime y'all are trying to figure out the charge, they either will give you both and say, find me the charge, or they'll give you the charge and the protons, most of the time they'll do that, and say, tell me the electrons. They'll never ask for how many protons. They really, I don't see a purpose in them ever asking. So first off, now let's ask this again. Who was the first to notice that the electron cloud has different levels? Bohr, yay. Most people start shouting out random names. But Bohr, Niels Bohr came up with the levels, even though he his model was wrong about planetary orbit, like element, I mean, with the electrons around the nucleus. But uh, he was right about the levels. Just like an onion has layers, so does a uh, atom. There are various energy levels in an electron cloud. Within each energy level, there are sublevels, and within each sublevel, there are orbitals. So electrons move very fast within their own orbital. And so this is where we get some, a lot of other kind of stuff. All right, I'm going to zoom into this picture now. Whee! Okay, now this picture is missing um, a level. They only stopped at six, but th there are seven energy levels. And that is important that you know. See right here on the picture? By the way, when you see N equals whatever, they're talking about the energy level. So, I mean, don't freak out. It's not a formula. Well, it is a formula, but anyway. All right, so this is the uh, nucleus part. And then as you get to this first ring, that is the first level. Second level, third level, fourth level, fifth level, sixth level, and then there's another seventh level. But that seventh level is... Uh, very big and it's kind of crazy. So there is going to be an easy way for y'all to uh, memorize all this because it's actually very easy. Each level that we're talking about, now notice this is the level that we're at right here. Each level has sublevels and orbitals and within those they can hold a certain amount of electrons. Right now we're going to sum up all the sublevels and just talk about the energy level right now. Okay, Make it a lot easier because when we get there it gets crazy. Uh, so each level can hold up to a total number of electrons and look at your periodic table when you do this please because there is a correlation. You see you have seven energy levels. What on your periodic table correlates with that? Well nitrogen has that atomic number. The rows. Okay. So let's take a look. Look on the very left side of your periodic table. Ah, the seven rows. Those seven rows are called periods. And yes, that's the periods of the periodic table. That's why it's called the periodic table, <laughs> if you ever want to know. The columns are going to be your groups, and we're going to talk about those groups here in a little bit. But there are seven periods, and that's going to be one thing that you're going to color in here in a second. Guess what? Seven periods, seven energy levels. Within each row, that's how many electrons you can hold in each one. In other words, what I'm trying to say is count how many elements are in the first energy level or uh, the first period. Two. 
Guess how many electrons the first one can hold? Two. Oh, that's crazy. Blows your mind, right? Now count in the second and third. They're actually uh, repeating a little bit. One, two, three, four. Eight. So if you count each element, guess what? That also tells you how many electrons. Because every time you go up in an element, aren't you actually increasing in your atomic number by one? And if you do that, guess what? You're also going up in electrons by one. And that's how you can easily count that. And it takes off a lot of stress because then you don't have to sit there and be like, I don't know how many electrons. Uh, and I'll go back here in a second. For, for example, let's take a look at the third noble gas, argon. What's its atomic number? 18. 18. Okay. So he also ends on that row, right? Count up these. 2 plus 8 plus 8. That's 18. So you can count up how many they'll all have, but they can only fit so many in a row. Once this guy gets filled up, they move to the next one. And so as they keep stuffing these rows, the wider you get out, the more they can hold. And that makes sense because you're not, your radius is a lot bigger as you get further out. Okay. So let's keep going up. So four and five are also identical. If you were to count those across, how many is in there? 18. I yeah, already counted. 18, 18. And the last two. 17? Oh, don't forget to include these guys. 32. So that is one problem with the periodic table. And why I like y'all's periodic table a lot better than mine is that if you'll notice, they put this gap right here to take all these guys and fit right there. Unlike some other periodic tables, they kind of shift everything and they add in the lanthanide and actide. So if you count your periodic tables, there's 14 right here. If you count the ones up there, there's actually one extra. And that just screws up students' minds. That one back there does the same thing and that one over there does too. The one I give you is actually a lot easier for you and it's going to help later. So that's why I'm telling you right now, use yours. Don't look at some of these because they'll be like, well, why is this one shifted? It just kind of helps out. Basically, what I'm saying is if you take these guys, put them right there, you'd stretch out the periodic table. And that's how it really looks. Uh, we don't put, do that because, well, yeah, that'd be too much paper to use. It wouldn't fit on an 8 by 11 and a half paper. So what would y'all say? 32. 32. And that's right. All right, so now this gets us into our lab, and I am going to zoom into these, so don't uh, squint too hard. Let me erase those numbers real fast. So absorption and emission. This also gets into uh, how we see things and how colors actually come up. Now let me zoom into this first part here so you can actually read it a little bit better. All right, so absorption and emission. Normally electrons are in, uh, I'm sorry, normally electrons in an atom they're in a ground state. Basically what that means, they're in the lowest possible energy levels. In other words, they're normal. They're in the level they like to be. They're staying in there. They're moving around, da 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 Okay, makes sense. Um, however, these electrons can be excited. So let's say some outside source comes in and uh, starts messing with things. What's going to happen then is those electrons are going to jump around. Okay, they're now at a party and they're going to be moving and doing stuff. All right. So basically, you just got to know how they, how they work, okay? Uh, if the electron is excited to a higher energy level, in other words, if they jump up, they're going to absorb energy, okay? If they then are dropped down at a level, they're then going to emit. All right, so anyway, once they're in an excited state, uh, they become unstable and thus emit energy, and that's how we're actually able to see certain things. So tomorrow, y'all are going to be exciting some uh, elements, and you're actually going to see um, different colors. But that process is called emission. Now let me tell you, these two things are happening at once. So it's a lot like two things affecting one another. And it's actually pretty exciting. That's why it's at an excited state. Whee! So nice little picture here. I like what this is. Um, so what y'all are going to do tomorrow is uh, y'all are going to light up the bunch of burners and y'all are going to set some stuff on fire. Okay, uh, but there is a procedure there. Basically, there are different elements I'm going to let y'all set on fire, and they're all going to burn different colors, and that's what they put inside fireworks to give the different colors when they explode. And then I know I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, this process is actually very important. Okay, so when you see a squiggly, like that, 
that's an outside energy source like a photon or another electron moving at high speed hitting the cloud. Well, if you're hitting the cloud, you're probably going to hit that electron moving at high speed. This is going to cause some kind of a problem. When this happens, though, it probably knocks this one up in a level. Well, when they go up in a level, they're going to absorb energy. But they don't like being at that level. They're going to want to come back down. And when they do come back down, that then they're going to emit energy. This process is going to happen all the time. You are going to use fire, which is an energy source, to excite some electrons. So the energy is going to come in, and they're going to bump up. And then they're going to go right back down. So that's what you're doing. You're causing this little thing happen. But basically, guys, what's going on, that's happening over and over and over and over and over and over again. You don't see it happening because it's happening so fast tomorrow. So when you see something burning, that's what's happening. This is happening. You're seeing, doesn't candles and things you burn give off light? You can then see. Same thing's happening above your head right now and in front of you right here. Electrons are getting excited because of electricity running through it. And so that's how you're able to see. They're doing that process, jumping higher to lower, lower to higher all the time. Now, when we cut off that energy source, it's going to go back to ground state and not do anything. But what's crazy is the, uh, the corns and rods in your eyeball is actually picking up those wavelengths it's giving off. So it's actually sending off a wavelength every time it does that. We'll get into wavelengths here in a second. This is where we start. Uh... Okay, so the cycle of absorption and emission happens very fast over and over again, like I just said. Uh, atoms can get excited using heat, light, or electricity. So nowadays we use electricity. Back in the day, they used to use candles to see in the dark. Um, and candles are still very efficient today. They burn a long time. Uh, bless you. All right, emission is usually in the form of light. Different energies uh, of light have different colors. Sound works the same way. It's just a different frequency. Uh, radio waves, microwaves, everything actually goes around in waves. And that's what's scary because the same energy of sound is similar to the energy of light. And when people actually notice that it's nothing but, all energy is nothing but waves, it kind of like, like, oh, okay. So I have this little chart over here, and it's small from where you're sitting, but basically this shows the, almost the entire spectrum of everything we know about. And basically, so you have the uh, radio waves and microwaves and things like that. Then we have our visible spectrum when we pick up light and how we see colors. Notice all the energies. This is, let's say it was the whole thing. We, this is like maybe one bar up here. That's basically what we're, our eyes can perceive. So there are some insects out there that can see other colors that are beyond our realm of uh, sight, which is actually mind-blowing when you think about it. And I'm going to show you all a video here in a little bit that actually makes your mind blow a little bit more. Um, Wait, what do insects do? Some insects, uh, like there's, a, I think, a rainbow lobster, they call it. Uh, they can see a different frequency of light. I think bees can see more in the infrared region, and we can't. It just looks like red to us, but to them, they actually see the different uh, shades. Um, there are some people out there that say that they can see sound. I don't know if they're cuckoo, but you know. But anyway, this is the other thing you got to know that will be on the test. Whee! Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You need to know those colors of the rainbow. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now notice this. This is the infrared region. We cannot see this. It looks just red to us. But there are different shades, and it gets a little bit deeper every single time. So there are infrared uh, cameras and things that we actually use. It's just like if you watch the movie Predator. Over here, you get to the ultraviolet region. Okay, notice how, why it's called ultraviolet. Well, here's violet. That's the last part that we can see, and then it just gets UV. All right, so let me ask you this question. Good quiz question here. Which side of the spectrum has a higher energy, the left or the right? That's actually left or right. I mean, I'm not, this isn't a trick question. Uh, it is on this side. So why do you think on this side? Shorter wavelength. Shorter wavelength. Um, we also said ultraviolet, right? That's caused cancer, right? Is that kind of what you thought maybe? I didn't know that caused cancer. Yeah, UV rays, that's what they're worried about because of our ozone layer. It's being depleted and things like that, and yada, yada, yada. Actually, this is what happens when you go to the tanning bed. <laughs> 
So it, it is healthy to get sunlight because you need it for uh, making vitamin B and things like that. And it does help with depression. So there is pros and cons to certain things. But some people do over tan. Some people tan every day. And if you do that, you are really getting high risk of cancer. Yes, that side is, has more energy in it. And it's really simple to actually think about. Please don't make fun of me when I do this. Imagine you have a rope. You ever took a water hose and you whipped it? Okay, you're like, whoosh. So same thing here. If you move low energy, kind of like this, you're going to have longer waves, right? Like, woo, woo. So that's what I'm doing right here. I'm just doing that, and it's making longer waves. I'm putting less energy into it, okay? If you put more energy into it, and you're just doing this, you're going to make this little wavelength more choppy, okay? It's going to be a choppy. Why is everybody laughing when I do that? Uh, so what's going on is that when you're doing it really, really fast, you're actually getting this shorter wavelength, but higher frequency. Frequency is how many times that peak happens. And so we're not going to go too much into that. That's more in the physical science region. I'd love to go more into it, but then that'd be a whole other unit. And um, yeah, we ain't got time for that. That's more AP stuff anyway. Uh, but the main thing you need to know is what side of that spectrum has more energy? The right side. Now, don't always say the right side because they will screw with you and flip it and not keep it to the Roy G. Biv. They'll do the Viv good your. Uh, and so... <laughs> I didn't realize what that said afterwards. Vib -gi -gior. Um, But it is always in that order. So you need to know red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. So whatever side the violet region is on, guys, that's the higher energy. Whatever side the red region is on, that's the lower. That's really the take home point right there. Because they'll flip it. They will. They don't care. They're a honey badger. So, but this also gives us out our fireworks. So different elements that you put inside the fire or you excite it will give you different colors. That's because the electrons are jumping from different levels in, the, um, in their electron cloud. So sodium is going to give off more of that little um, kind of gold, yellow look. Uh, copper is going to give off a blue, ironically. Most people think it gives off green. Um, titanium gives off the nice silver that everybody likes. Strontium, barium, all these kind of guys. Okay, so let me turn off the lights real quick so you can see these a little bit better. So this is actually a periodic table of each element giving off the color. And this is what blows your mind. When you excite these electrons, it's not just one color that's showing at one time. It's just like how your printer works. It blends colors together, giving off that one color. So all the colors of the rainbow blend in a certain way to give us off a certain shade. So each of the ones you see up there, you might have to squint for some of the other guys. Like they're not giving off as much like hydrogen, helium. Uh, but other metals are going to give off a little bit more. And so when they all come off together, they're showing all these frequencies of lights hitting your eye. Do they all give off light? Yes. They all, because what's going on is those electrons are jumping, and they're all, since there's more than one electron, they're going to give off different levels of energy because the frequency is jumping from, like, level one to level three. And then that's also two to three. It's also, like, jumping three down to one. And they're all going to give off a certain frequency. Okay. So before we get into the video, the total number of energy levels an atom has corresponds to the period number on the atom. PT for short, periodic table. Periods are horizontal rows on there. So the rows that y'all were talking about, those are the periods. We don't call them rows in chemistry because we like to be different. We'll call them periods. I know too, yes, columns, rows, it's easier, it's the same thing. <coughs> So anyway, for example, if you find bromine, he's in period four. And it's just like playing Battleship. You just go across. And uh, he's in energy level four because he's in period four. Now, I will tell you, though, some stuff does shift when you get to the metals. It works for, like, the first three or four levels. But then uh, there's always exceptions to the rules, and we'll talk about that next week. Okay, the outer energy level is called the valence shell. That is very important, extremely important. Because the valence shell, that's what we want to satisfy. That means you can only hold up to eight electrons to have a balanced atom. That is very essential, and that's what we're going to get into. So the valence shell is just the outermost one. So guess where all the fun happens in an, uh, in an atom? Valence. The valence shell. All the others are filled up below. Every level below that is filled up, so nothing really happens. The only, the outer part is where all the party happens. And so that's where all the fun, interesting little stuff happens here. All right, so cations have a, what kind of charge? Positive. 
I should have an option for neutral. Cat, because cats are positive and because it has a T in it. Uh, the more positive an atom, I, an atom is, the more electrons it has or the fewer? fewer? The fewer. And most people think because when you hear the word uh, more, they think then, well, you're gaining. So therefore, that should be a positive, and that's not true. So don't get the word positive confused with uh, greater. Uh, if an electron drops from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, the energy is what? All right, so you got your little dance thing, and you got from higher to lower, it is released. So that is emit, yes. Yeah, y'all knew what emit is. Okay. I, was, I just like, you know, I can't draw the hand going foo there. So anyway, uh, the total number of energy levels an element has corresponds to what? The period. So if you look on the side of your periodic table, you'll notice it'll be all these little guys going down all the way to seven. Uh, do, 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 do. Last one, number five. Number five, the valence shell is electrons located in the what part? The outermost. And to be honest, that's where all the fun happens. And that was the very last thing we did. So these weren't so bad. Electrons are not too hard to get.